Uh, you heard the introduction this morning. I'm not going to take the time to reiterate that. But there is one more thing I wish I had said. I said, you know, he could have been the President of the United States. He could have been Senator, uh, Attorney General at the state level and at the United States level. A lot of things. <laughs> What's the matter? Those shoes. I knew, I knew he was going to make a comment about my shoes, but I didn't get to him fast enough to tell him not to do that. Um, but one thing, one thing I did not say this morning that I should have is that he could have been a comedian. Because he is. He is. Some people just were born, I think, with witty brains, and they see the funny side of everything. And that's nice. I, I wanted to say one other quick thing before I turn the time over to him. When he told me several years ago, he was making speeches and giving presentations and addresses, and they would pay him $50,000 and more. And when I heard that, I said to him, well, that's too bad. And he said, why? I said, because I was going to invite you to come and speak at a prayer conference. And... He has, I don't know how many times you've spoken for us, but um, we don't pay him $50,000. Okay. Yeah. Let's have a hand for her shoes. <laughs> There's one other thing I was supposed to but do. But all you with shoes like this stand up and say, my shoes are beautiful. <laughs> There was one other thing I was supposed oh, yeah, to do. Oh, yeah, look at where. It's just a minute. I want you to get a shot. Of it. There you are. Look at these, sir, folks, on the big screen. I'll tell you what. I'll tell That's you. where the 50000 went, right there. <laughs> those, those, those kind of shoes don't come cheap, I guarantee you. <laughs> these were. These what? Were, those they were, were cheap? Marked, they were marked, marked way down. down to yes. 50000 <laughs> One other thing I was supposed to do before I leave the stage is to pray for him. And you've been sitting a lot, but, uh, and you've, you've had a little bit of a break, but stand with me while we pray. Father in heaven, you have brought the general here for a purpose. You have prepared him and prepared us because you have something, in addition to what we heard this morning, that will be a great blessing to us. And so may he have the assurance and the sense that the angels are standing by his side. Amen. And that your Holy Spirit continually works through him. We are grateful for this man. We all love him, but we want to see Jesus. And we know that this is what he does best, is to share his love for the Lord. So bless our time now together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Good, yeah. It, there's only one. <laughs> she calls you up and she says, Ashcroft, do you still believe in free speech? I said, of course. She says, well, I want you to come and make one. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> and not only that, she puts a title on your speech. This morning, I forgot to mention the title this morning. Pretty embarrassed. I went to lunch like this, you know. <laughs> Every week a burning bush. I think that's good. I'm for it. Um, the burning bush is an interesting thing to me. Because it tells me that the presence of God can be anywhere. Even the back of the desert, when things are at their worst, when you're way out, when you're by yourself, you're not at the heart of things. You're not within, you're not within rifle range of a church. The presence of God's still there. And that's very important. And what we're talking about is the presence of God. You think of how God creates man in his own image, but somehow 
and this is a mystery, I can't figure it out, that God, who is everything and has everything and is complete, somehow can be made happy by us. I, it's hard to understand that if God is everything, how can we add something? But the Bible does say that the angels rejoice and that God himself rejoices over us with singing. And in the Garden of Eden, he came to walk with people on a regular basis. It was just an, an intimate relationship of walking and talking together. What a beautiful picture. And uh, the idea that somehow God is available only in reserved settings or in special places is the enemy, I think, of what God intends for us. I think he intends to be willing to meet us at the backside of the desert. And uh, we need to find ways to encounter him on a regular basis. So every week a burning bush is a good idea to me. And uh, the bush can burn, be burning even if it is in a church. And even if it is within the walls of what we sometimes thinks, think contains God. And I think that one of the things that at least, and you gotta understand that this is, um, I'm not a theologian, so be very careful. I warn you in advance, but I think Jesus came to stop God from being localized. He, he was to be generalized. Amen. Jesus came for one purpose and he left for the same purpose in my judgment. And the most important thing that happened other than the redemption of sin on the cross at the time of the crucifixion, what else happened? Do you, do you remember what happened? What, what dramatic event took place? Yeah. Isn't that spectacular? The idea that the, the most intimate presence of God was reserved to a very few and was limited, that God was to be contained behind a curtain, gone. And all of a sudden, you and I are invited into the presence of God. And in mysterious ways, I don't claim to understand this, that not only are we invited into the presence of God, but God is invited into our presence so that God inhabits us, not a place behind a curtain where we can't go, but he comes to live in us. You talk about something that gives people human dignity, gives people a sense of value and worth. It's the presence of God in us. And the idea that God shares with us the most profound opportunities of the universe. What's, a noble, what's the most noble thing that Jesus came to do? To provide redemption. How does redemption take place? It takes place if ordinary people tell other people about the gospel. And so the very most important thing that the Godhead has to share, uh, that, that it shares within itself, it shares with humanity. The big, there's a super picture that I wrote a song about this one time, a guy named Simon the Cyrenian. You know him. The guy standing beside the road when Jesus is carrying the cross to Calvary. And, and the plan of God was for Jesus to slump and stumble beneath the load and they grab an ordinary guy off the side of the road and have him carry the cross for the Savior. I was thinking about that one time a hundred years ago. Not quite, but you gotta understand you're talking to a politician. Um, and I thought, I wish I'd been Simon the Cyrenian. I would like to have been the guy who was pulled off the side of the road and said, I'll help you with that, Jesus. And then it dawned on me that that's not a role that's reserved to Simon the Cyrenian. Every Christian has the opportunity to carry the cross and to share. And, and this idea of the relationship between God and man is that worshipful relationship is the most powerful, energizing, dignifying relationship 
that we could ever imagine for humanity. And that's what worship is all about. It's this relationship. We can't say the word God in the Christian understanding of God without describing a relationship. The whole idea of God is a relationship. And um, that idea of an intimate relationship that doesn't have barriers in it or where we transcend the barriers is very important to me. Now, one of my concerns is that I think it is the propensity and proclivity of mankind always to erect barriers between God and man. And if we're not careful, the institutional church erects the barriers. So that you have to go through somebody special, do something special, be someplace special in order for that to be the case. Jesus dies so that the veil is ripped from top to bottom. And then Jesus, in my judgment, ascends into heaven to generalize his presence rather than to localize his presence. Now what if the resurrected Christ had just stayed on earth and he were in Cincinnati today, we'd all feel like we'd want to go to Cincinnati to be a part of that meeting. But Jesus says to us that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And that's what I think our worship setting ought to be. I was in Romania a couple of years ago and was asked to speak to the evangelical ministers of Romania. The Romanian church is growing sort of a geographic, geometric proportions, just skyrocketing in membership. And I said, folks, I have one request of you. They inched forward on their seats. What is it? I said, don't repair the veil. And if we're not careful, both in structure of our organizations and in our practice, we develop a veil. And I can't speak about your tradition and the Seventh-day Adventist tradition, but I'm afraid of some of the things that are happening in my tradition, that the veil seems to be being stitched up with the professionalization of the church. You know, it used to be that they called on brother or sister so-and-so to pray or to do this or that or the other. Now they're all folks out of the schools, the Bible schools or the seminaries. And it used to be that some of our music would be music that could be sung. But so often now we have teams of people that sing and everyone else gets to watch. We need to be a participational church. We don't need to be an observational church. I'm not against new music. And I, 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 I'm not against good music, but I want people. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the burning bush. How we need not to, we don't want to isolate it. We don't want to put the fire out. And we don't want to restitch the veil. And uh, my passion for this is that uh, we would not forsake certain kinds of music. And it, it's a little dangerous to label it because it, you can jump to conclusions. But there are, is a treasure of heritage of hymns and gospel songs that have certain characteristics that I think are really worth pursuing. And the first character, and you know what? Anytime you want to interrupt me or put up a hand and say, yeah, but how about this? Do it. I'm not running for anything. <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, the first thing that I think ought to have in our work, worship music is content. And uh, yeah, somebody said the word substance. Yeah, thank you for that word. That's a good word. And uh, I really prefer if it's substance that when you sing it, you know that it's referring to the Christian faith. Amen. If it's just words that could apply to virtually any faith there is, I have a little less confidence in it. But let me, I, I, don't, I don't know that I can define this with precision, but there are some 
there are some songs that are just are so rich. They illustrate the kind of content that I think is very important. Now, you will forgive me for my piano playing. Please. Um, I heard you this morning singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You know, wow. This is, you turn that down just a little second verse goes summer and winter springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love the rich rich Great is thy faithfulness. The first verse, the second verse elaborates on that, whether it's summer or winter. The third verse is really what I consider to be the where the song hits pay dirt. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for to Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today, the power of God. And bright hope for tomorrow, the promise of God. The pardon, peace, presence, power, and promise of God in one verse. When I, when I talk about the value of substance in worship, sometimes we gloss over it. And maybe that's not all bad when the substance is there. We're programming it up here. And when the time comes, it's there. And the, what does the chorus go? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Do, 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 do. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. So the pardon, the peace, the presence, the promise, the power, and the provision of God in one verse. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto me. If I have a philosophy of gospel music and a philosophy of worship music that provides a basis for the relationship that we want when there is no veil and we on a daily basis walk and talk with God when he honors the promise that two or three he's in the midst specially and he also honors the promise that he lives in us I want it to be based on that kind that kind of substance I think was the word or content in the music so let me just suggest that we have substance and content second point that I would make is that uh, I think our music ought to be consistent with a Christian worldview. I'm really getting ready to skate out on thin ice here, so turn up your skeptic meter. So you don't want to be taking stuff lock, stock, and barrel, but if there's a big dividing line, a fault line, if you will, like continental shelves, 
We're sitting on a fault here, aren't we, the San Andreas? If this room starts shaking, I'll be out of here in a hurry. Um, if there's a big fault line in the culture of the world, I believe it's between people who are accidentalists. I think we got here by accident that there was some swamp somewhere. They can't describe where it came from, but that's, this is their approach. And there was a lightning strike on the swamp or something like that that was a catalyst that congealed or otherwise operated on some proteins that finally found them way, their way into becoming life form and we evolved into humanity. These are accidentalists. Uh, and frankly, I think it is a logical imperative for them to believe that someday, statistically, there will be a convergence of random events that will extinguish us like that which brought us into, according to their interpretation, into existence. And that's a worldview. Those people are, some of them, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be critical of them, but I think that worldview says, live for the present, there is no ultimate meaning, there, is, uh, there, there are no ennobling features, this thing is a big accident that happened and it'll be undone someday as another big accident. There's another side of this huge fault line in the world's cultures, which is intentionalists. And we believe that we're objects of intention. Yes, sir. That God created the heavens and the earth. And that this supreme and way beyond my capacity to describe. But this supreme being reached down and out of the elements of the earth shaped us together and then in an act of ultimate inspiration. Which means, I think in the Greek it has, spiro has to do with breathing and it inspires to share breath, put spirit into. God shares who? Now, just put aside all the business about whether that gives us dignity or not. I like the idea of sharing God's breath. I like, the, I like this, what this says about me, that we were not an accident. We're created, and we are created with intention and purpose. And the Bible tells us that we actually have this kind of purpose. And what is, where is it? I think it's in Jeremiah someplace. It says there's a plan for us and that we have an expected end. Is that it? Yeah, some of you guys who are a lot better than I am at this stuff. I like that idea. No surprises. This stuff was intentional. Has a, we believe in a clear beginning and an expected end. I think the art form of our music ought to have some of that in it. We ought to have, it ought to be stuff that's under, you know, the Bible is a revelation. God is so desperate that we know him and understand him and relate to him that he provides this revelation. And after thousands of years of our unsuccessful understanding of the revelation, he says, I've got to make it clearer than that. And Jesus is sent. The revelation of God. This is how important it is that we, that God is knowable. So I think our music ought to have clear beginning. It ought to have clear ending. It ought to be knowable. It ought to be singable. It ought to be something that our congregations can participate in. I don't want it just to be something that's sung at the congregation or sung to the congregation by some folks who show up on a, on a weeknight or do something else to put on a special presentation. I'm in favor of special music. And I, some, you guys have all been made victims of some performance music that I wrote a couple, a couple decades ago in, a, in an album. Some of you have gotten copies of it. I'm not against gospel music, but I am, when it comes to worshiping God, I, I want it to be music that the congregation can participate in and in, in which they can. And, and, and that's why it needs to be knowable and understandable. And I think that's consistent with a Christian worldview. When I went to Yale as an undergrad, I, I was too small, according to my football coach, to play football in the Big 8, which was, used to be the Middle West. And then it became the Big 12, and now it's all broken up. 
Turn, and so he sent me out east to play football. And turns out I was too small and too slow to play out there. But I, I went out there. Anyhow, and, but I went to Yale. And there was a guy out there who was a painter. They said he was a painter. He was pouring buckets of paint off the tops of buildings that would splatter on the canvas. And they called it art. Well, that's a world view. If your world view is that creativity is accidentalism, you can be accidental in the way you create your art. Just throw it out there and let it splatter. And nobody can know what you're doing. Somebody might say, I kind of like that. But I think, you know, to be consistent with a Christian worldview, our music ought to be knowable, understandable, and the art form itself ought not to devalue the idea that there is a clear understanding of rationality imposed by a God of intelligence that created us with purpose and intention. Uh, I, I really prefer it if when we do our singing we, we don't suggest to people that they, they're too dumb to know the music and, and I, I, I say this tenderly but when all they put up on the screen is the words I don't really know whether they want me to sing or not you know, uh, not too long ago, and I asked Ruthie for a hymn book of the uh, Seventh Day Adventists before, and it, it was a beautiful book. Yeah. It really was comforting to me. I saw that there was a song in there by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Yeah, yeah number 17. I thought, a Supreme Court justice wrote a hymn. Turns out it was his father. <laughs> but, but that's, uh, but, you know, uh, so the idea of our having stuff that's at least knowable and then providing a basis for people to know it is an idea which I think is worthy of our consideration. I hope I'm not offensive to you in saying this. I'm telling you what's happening in my church. I think sometimes it's up there on the screen so we might be able to clearly understand what the professional worshipers are saying, but... We don't know what the next note is or where the melody goes. Uh, but I'm not sure they want me to. So, uh, I think you're right. Now, do you want equal time here? No, I'm serious. I, I, you know, there are some things that are on my heart, like are really burdensome, and I feel... But I'm not sure about this. But I just... I have... I have, as I've watched in my own denomination, an abandonment of, of music of substance and an abandonment of music that has the clarity and understandability that I think is consistent. There's another point. Let me move on to another one since I've got to the meddling part of this part. I'll move to another one. And that is, I think, the art form of our music. Now, you'll notice that the second and third points I'm making are about the art form. Because a lot of people say, well, it doesn't matter what the art form is so long as the words... Well, I think there are certain aspects of the art form that are important. I don't know that it makes anything else bad, but I think it's suboptimal, if that's a way of talking. Well, one of the things that I would say is that when we talk about the nature of God, we talk about God as a relationship. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um... To me, this is a marvelous picture of the value of plurality. There's a mystery about this. Some of you probably as theologians could explain it better than I. There's a unity in the Godhead, but there is plurality in the Godhead. I think this is one of the most amazing things in the world. That, that plurality and diversity are not the enemies of beauty or achievement. They are the friends of beauty and achievement. I'll tell you a little story. Um, a couple decades ago now, I was governor of Missouri. And our St. Louis Symphony was the number one or two symphony in the world. It literally was really hot stuff. Leonard Slotkin, who is now the went from there to be the head of the National Symphony in Washington, D.C., is the 
and they were getting Grammys every year for the best symphonic performances. So I decide I'm taking them to Tokyo with me to, to invite some Japanese companies to build plants in Missouri for jobs for our workers. So I haul the whole St. Louis Symphony over to Tokyo, putting on a big concert, spectacular concert hall in Tokyo. Uh, a fellow named Mr. Oba, uh, chairman of a company called Kawasaki Heavy Industries. I'm saying, Oba, come on, I want you to show you what great culture we have in Missouri, and I take him to the symphony. Incidentally, there's a nice Kawasaki engine plant in the state of Missouri now, so some of this stuff works. But that's not my point. As we were approaching the, the hall that night, I watched people carrying in their instruments. And there was the tuba player and the bass violin player with the great big ones, and there was the piccolo player with, and the trombone player. I mean, all kinds of different instruments. And they were going to go in the hall and they were going to sit in a hundred different places and they were going to put music on the stands and lo and behold, the notes on each one of those stands would be different. <laughs> I just had this moment of panic. I said, this could be a disaster. I mean, there's a lot of diversity there. But you know what would have been a real disaster if they'd all been carrying the same instrument? And if they were all going to play the same note through the whole thing, never changing. And the difference between uniformity, which everyone being the same, and unity is that there is diversity, but it is devoted in accordance with with a common goal or objective and in a cooperative spirit. And I think that's what God expects. I think that's, that's the way the universe is designed. The greatest achievements are the result of harmonics that come into, and you know something? Uniformity can't get you there. You can't get to beauty with uniformity. Try painting a picture with only one color. But diversity is the basis for beauty and achievement. Harmonics. And I think our music ought to be susceptible to harmony. And uh, frankly, there is some music which is easy for people to participate in and sing harmony and some music which is just virtually impossible for people to figure out a harmonic to it. And for me, if I think of a picture of God, I think of three-part harmony. Well, not really. Because God prefers four-part harmony, doesn't he? He's got a place for you and me in that equation. And he, according to Zephaniah, rejoices over us with singing, I think that's part of the harmonic. So I, I think good music, the art form itself ought to be susceptible to the harmonics that would be found in our understanding of God. Last point I would like to make is that, uh, and then I, I'd be pleased to hear from you. And there should be a, an opposing voice here or something, but this is a, a philosophy which I have that I think should frame our worship. And we, should, we shouldn't be thoughtless about it, you know. Uh, I was in one of our churches not too long ago, and they sang four songs, and the last song they sang was a song entitled, This is the Only Song I Can Sing. I said, wait a second, did we just sing three other songs? <laughs> you know. I, with poetic license, I suppose that's okay. But I think we ought to do things that are inclusive. That you ought to find ways and, and worship potentials that don't separate people from each other, but that bring them together. Now, this is a little bit like the other points. 
but whosoever will may come is a theme that I think um, is at the core of our understanding of God. And so having songs that really just are not susceptible to broad levels of participation, not, that, in, not saying there shouldn't be songs, but in terms of worship, I think we ought to have the kinds of songs which we can uh, welcome and invite very significant participation on a broad level. So what does this have to do with the veil? I don't think we should, in our music, stitch up the curtain so that some people can't get there. We shouldn't make the notes unavailable to people who aren't. Someone new to the church wants to learn the song, but it's only available if you already know the notes in there before. That's a few more stitches. I hate the idea of the art form somehow devaluating, devaluing our understanding of God as being an intelligent, knowable source of creation who endows us with the dignity of eternal purpose and doesn't leave us in an accidental setting. You know, the ultimate of accidental music is the computer-generated atonal stuff. And, just, and, you know, some people, actually, that is an art form. I don't think that art form reinforces our notion of who God is and who we are as a part of his creation. Uh, and uh, content. When a song in and of itself can can suggest the, a wide variety of the virtues of the Christian faith or can paint the picture of uh, how we come to faith or how we praise God in the faith. That kind of content is worthy. The uh, little pamphlet that I handed out this morning talked about teaching with hymns. Does somebody have a copy of that? With them, would you stand up and read read that set of verses for me, please? Uh, God's instruction to sing. The Bible's instruction to sing. And now I'm going to have I'm going to borrow this from you. Yeah. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Does that say content? You're teaching and admonishing. One uh, thing that really strikes me about this is admonition in song. Uh, one of the challenges we have is in admonishing other, each other how to behave. If I come and tell you how to behave, it's not too appealing to you. If you come and tell me, as fragile as my ego is, I just might crumble totally. But this says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs. If we sing the right things. It has a teaching function and an admonition function and it is gentle and it is loving and it's kind and in general it's not too pointed. If the Spirit of God uses a song to convict one of us about our behavior based on the content of the song, so be it. But it doesn't, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be other admonition teaching, but here's a gentle way for us to use the substantial if you will, content of the songs in order to teach. It is good to sing praises and it is pleasant. Praise is comely. Sing with thanksgiving. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. I wanted to make one last point out of that and I will give you this back. I'm glad for you to have it. Our spirit and 
should be nourished by the singing, but we should also be careful that the understanding be there as well. So I think the content, again, is reinforced. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. The world has understood forever the value of using music to cement and to drive a message. And I could sing the first two notes of a song, and I will guarantee you that every other person in this room could finish the entire song perfectly because it has been so perfectly taught. It goes like this. A, B, That's enough, that's enough. That's enough. I mean, you know, but, you know, if this, this is a biblical principle. Use the music for teaching and admonishing and sharing content. And it becomes an element of worship. And what happens is if the music and melody is learned, then we go to the first part of the paragraph which says, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I venture to say to you that none of us has ever uh, been absent an occasion in life when one of the melodies that we learned in church or in church school didn't just come back to us, reinforced. And in, in virtually every service to me, Theme after theme reoccurs in my life. At the close of our service this morning, I thought of, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Another Fanny Crosby song. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Uh, I think the time is about up. What questions do you have? Or uh, Yes, sir. Uh huh. Amazing Grace is all about what God did. For sure. Us. And the high chains are gone is a free part of the gospel. Uh, what do you think of the blending of all Oh, I, that's been happening for centuries and it's wonderful. See, I'm not against the old or the new. I'm in favor of content, I'm in favor of things which reinforce the nature of a Christian worldview and don't devalue our understanding of the nature of God and that are inclusive. And I'm trying to think for me of a great one of the blends of history. Uh, Isaac Watts wrote a song. The last one verse goes, Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown. And love beyond degree. At the cross. Kind of interesting. At the cross was added as a chorus to that song. About 175 years after Isaac Watts wrote it. Isaac Watts I think wrote that in about 1706. If I'm not mistaken. That's the Watts era. And a guy. If, I, if, he was a, if you got a book. I think a guy named Hudson or something like that wrote the At the Cross chorus to it in the late 19th century, around 1890 or something like that. Strangely enough, I think it was Fanny Crosby, now maybe another one of the great songwriters, who... Uh, who had a really strong conversion experience with the verse, was it for crimes that I had done, he groaned upon the tree, in the interval between the original writing and the at the cross. 
And frankly, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Whew. Yes, I, wonderful. Op- and those, we should encourage that. There's nothing sacred about the old unless it's for other reasons sacred. And nothing wonderful about the new unless it's for other reasons wonderful. Yes, ma'am. You know, I think there would be scientists or social scientists that might have a theory about this. But as we become a more passive culture and we're entertained by TV and things that where we sit back and do the watching and someone else does the performing, we might find that that's pretty easy to do in church. I think there's danger in it. Um, God bless you. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, there, there are lots of, you know, I happen to, let me drop a name that I think is, Bill Gaither is a good friend of mine. He stayed in my home. It, it's, that's, it's not old stuff. It's not centuries old, but wonderful messages with the strength. And uh, relevant. it's relevant and it's got content and it doesn't, it's not at war with the Christian worldview. It doesn't try to, mimic the world so much as it tries to inspire the believer and I and so the newness or oldness isn't necessarily a part of it I I, I think that I look when I was a boy the Catholic Church reserved worship to a very few people and they re, re, worship was conducted by people in a different language so the average guy couldn't do anything but watch and thank God they went through a, began a transformation with Vatican something or other. I don't remember the Vatican II. And uh, they began to say, well, wait a second, we should let people know what's going on and have people sing and participate. So there's been a migration from that pendulum, which was way out on one end of you go in and watch and keep your mouth shut. Uh, in, in what I consider to be as a wholesome direction. Unfortunately, I think the professionalism of music in my church has been such that uh, <coughs> there's more watching and less participation all the time. I just, and I think, you know, there's a balance to be struck somewhere here. I'm, and I, this is why I tell you this. I didn't know I was doing this afternoon session until pretty late in this operation. And I, I, I know Ruthie's probably over there biting her nails. What's this guy talking about up there? But this is just way uh, some, and I feel that there is an opportunity for us. And I, I, I think young people need to be exposed yes. to singable hymns of content that don't devalue the Christian worldview and that support our understanding of who God is. Amen. I helped raise a substantial amount of money for, a, a co- I've given all my music interests to a college called Evangel University. And I helped raise money for a course there that number one, exposes students, not to impose anything on students, but to expose them to, this, to the value of this kind of music. And if students complete the course with a satisfactory grade, they get a scholarship for the next semester to help defray their expenses. So there's an incentive for students to take the course. And that's what I'm devoting my, most of my non-business life to now is to try and have us have a worship setting 
in which people find a meaningful uh, ministry of worship that sustains them. I call it a nourishing worship experience. And I find that the kinds of things that you and I participated in this morning, because this is always more beneficial to me than it is to others, that nourishes me. It just nourishes me. Sir. In show business, this is known as the hook. <laughs> it doesn't help at all if you made snide remarks about somebody's shoes earlier in the program. No, I want to, I want to suggest something that I think will be um, something you'll really enjoy, too. I know this whole uh, breakout session has been fantastic. My husband, I was sitting over here between Dr. Levy and my husband, and both of them were saying, profound, wonderful. He is right on target. And I know you are feeling the same way. This is wonderful stuff. But I would like to bring you back down to earth a minute. You want me to play the piano? Yes. Okay. I'd like to hear one thing. I'd like to hear Jesus Loves Me. Yeah, I love that. Would you that. like that? Is this your favorite song? I tell you what, I've got about 31 favorite songs, and this is 29 of them. <laughs> this is the greatest. You, you got, you'll sing it, won't you?
ce nu ne Jesus loves the Indian boy. Oh, oh, somebody else knows this. Who was singing with me? You? Oh, stand up and sing. Nobody else is singing with me. Oh, I'm going to start it again. Jesus loves the Indian boy. the most profound sir oh I'm just saying that's true Do you know we sang one of my I love the song this morning we sang just as I am you know the marvelous thing about Jesus is that he takes us as we are not that he loves the way we are If he loved the way we were, he'd just leave us alone that way. But he takes us as we are because he loves us too much to leave us that way. But I, uh, I you want to sing another one that I, I, one that I almost wanted to sing at the end was Pass Me Not. This is another, uh, another one of Fanny Crosby's great hymns. Pass me not, oh gentle stay. Oh. 